Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, should, uh, I would like to welcome you into today's AHN Nephrology Education Webinar. And today is series number 45. So the topic today is peritoneal dialysis in the developing world, opportunities and challenges. So we, we, we have Professor Abraham, George Abraham, the Professor of Nephrology and Senior Consultant at MGM Healthcare and Adjunct Professor of Nephrology at the Indian Institute of Technology, Chennai. Professor Georgi is the father of peritoneal dialysis in India, and he has ISN Roscoe uh, Robinson Award in, in Excellence of Education in Nephrology and Medicine. So, Professor Georgi, you are warmly welcome, and please, we are ready to listen from you. Thank you. Regina, it's always a delight and pleasure my African colleagues, because uh, we have been interacting with the African colleagues for over nearly one and a half decades, and um, uh, West Africa, Central Africa, and East Africa. So thank you for your kind introduction, and uh, I will move on with my talk. This is the hospital where I work now, and this is a tertiary care center where we have all specialties, and we predominantly have transplant program involving lung, heart, liver, and uh, kidney. And also we have uh, uh, a good uh, dialysis program, both PD and hemodialysis. And we are for consultant technology. And so I will now take you through my experience of PD in Toronto and India, and how this can be sort of translated for the African people. So I'm sure that many of you would be knowing these three giants of peritoneal dialysis in the world. Uh, we lost them, Professor Dimitrios Oriopoulos, who was my mentor, and Carl Dinolf from University of Missouri, Columbia, and uh, Stephen Vass, who was a uh, robust supporter of peritoneal dialysis all over the world, and the uh, little known Sharon Stath, who served the Toronto Hospital for 44 years before her retirement, and she lives in Toronto. So this is a picture which was taken in 1986, that is nearly 35 years ago. The nurses in the home peritoneal dialysis unit, they come from different parts of the world, Chinese, Taiwanese, uh, Latin American, and uh, Canadian. And then this is my close friend, fellow, uh, Professor Moshe Slotnik from the West Bank, Bersheba. I think he has retired now, and this is uh, the charming uh, Professor Dimitrios Oriopoulos and Dr. Joanne Bergman, who still continues as a faculty in the Toronto Hospital. And uh, many of you would recognize me sitting there. And this is Sharon Isan. And uh, they were the platform for peritoneal dialysis, the largest peritoneal dialysis program in 1986, probably in the world. Now, how to set up a peritoneal dialysis program I spoke about that in 1998 at the ISPD Congress in Seoul, Korea. And uh, the Indian scenario, although CAPD is a simple technique, it was not until we started the, uh, the and popularized it in India as an alternative to hemodialysis and as a bridge to transplantation in India. Even yesterday, we had a police inspector, civil law inspector who was on peritoneal dialysis who had a transplant done from her mother. And uh, so peritoneal dialysis acts as a bridge for transplantation. Now we have been facing challenges, challenges and more challenges in peritoneal dialysis in India. However, the Honorable Prime Minister of India, uh, Mr. Modi ji has included it in the government dialysis program, given equal uh, importance as that of hemodialysis. So the aim of chronic peritoneal dialysis treatment, the general aims are reduce morbidity and improve survival of patients with the CKD-5, improve quality of life compatible with the reasonable lifestyle. Specific aims are prevention of economic hardship of individual and communities, adequate socioeconomic support, adequate removal of uremic toxins and prevention of uremic symptoms, control of extracellular fluid accumulation, prevention, management of anemia, calcium phosphorus abnormalities, malnutrition, chronic inflammation, 
prevention of renal function deterioration that is residual renal function prevention of deterioration of the peritoneal membrane structure and function and prevention of mechanical metabolic adverse long term effect so these were the systems which were used when i was in toronto in the 80s this is the straight spike system i do not know whether it is popular in any part of the world this is the straight spike whereby the two liter collapsible bag you seen there hanging and then you have a spike here you spike it to the back and then you have that this is a transverse set and then this is a peritoneal dialysis catheter and peritoneum catheter and transverse set and then later on in 1996 uh, 1986 87 the o system came in this is what is called an o system this is a reusable system whereby you use it as a y system like this which is shown here and after the uh, infusion and disconnection is connected as an o and this is the patient and this is the o system which later on became modified as a disconnect y system this is called a y system whereby you have the peritoneal dialysis catheter you have the transverse set which is a y and then this is a drain back and this is the fill back and initially what you do is that you drain the fluid rounding 1000 1000 2000 3000 4 1005 and uh, then this is done to prevent contamination of fluid which is probably unsterile going into the peritoneal cavity and after the that this flush uh, you have the fill system so this is filling the peritoneal cavity and what you do after that is you take the system out for disconnect it here and then when it is drained the whole thing is being disposed of so this is the perfect y system which is being used in india i am sure that this will be the system which is being used in south uh, in south africa and in other uh, parts of africa so what are the this cartoon shows the different types modalities of peritoneal dialysis what we are talking about is Some continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. This is peritoneal volume. This is two liters. It's instilled into the peritoneal cavity, and this is during the night time. The dwell is about eight to ten hours, and during the day time you have three exchanges. And uh, so altogether, this is a four exchange cartoon. And here it is called the CCPD, continuous cyclic peritoneal dialysis, whereby you have they connected to a cycler. and you have short 12 exchanges and 1 2 3 4 and day time you leave 2 liters of fluid in the peritoneal cavity the whole time and uh, then you dispose it off before you do the start the dialysis at night and then you have apd automated peritoneal dialysis four times at night and uh, there is a day drive there is no fluid in the peritoneal cavity during the day so these are the different types of peritoneal dialysis which are being practiced as home therapy or chronic peritoneal dialysis therapy so factors determining loss of residual renal function a residual renal function is always better or better preserved in peritoneal dialysis compared to hemodialysis but there are certain factors which can lead to uh, loss of residual renal function larger body mass index diabetes mellitus congestive heart failure use of heavy use of diuretic hypotensive even episodes of multiple peritonitis inflammation peritoneal high transport status and use of apd so in uh, mean estimate is about 19.7 months to anuria and diabetes and non diabetic to be as long as 37.6 so you can see in this graph this is the loss of residual renal function in diabetes and non diabetic and the interval is shown there so the cfpd versus hemo dial the current recommendation for a successful pd program are one physician for 50 patients one pd nurse for 30 patients and each patient should be at regular contact with the pd unit at least once in a month the absolute contraindication to peritoneal dialysis are non functioning peritoneum from previous peritoneal surgery addition immediately following laparotomy and inability to do peritoneal dialysis either due to psychiatric illness or physical disability 
the potential advantage of cfpd r it can be done in any remote place as being done in india now and in other south asian countries and it is a home therapy does not require machinery does not require an access to the blood stream the water usage is 56 liters four exchanges a day for a week or uh, 42 liters three exchanges a day for a week each hemodialysis session you need to have 120 liters that is three times a week is 350 liters so key success factors for peritoneal dialysis program include the patient selection personal management product selection peritoneal dialysis prescription and pharmacotherapy protein calorie intake paraclinical support and parallel services patient online software phone and internet technology peritonitis exercise infection and other complication management preservation of residual renal function physiotherapy and rehabilitation patient management of patients because there are patients who are privately paying and those who are being reimbursed and then the government pays for a large uh, number of patients post graduate fellowship and academic activities to educate our young colleagues about uh, peritoneal dialysis so this is hemodialysis uh, quality quality expenses and this is peritoneal dialysis uh, qualitative expenses and so it is more expensive in developed countries a hemodialysis setup compared to peritoneal dialysis setup now patients start pd in six steps new patients are right identify new patients assess for pd eligibility eligible for pd patient chooses pd pd catheter implantation and pd start and then they are on pd for a time of uh, of period and they are lost for pd for various reasons so new pd patient pd time on pd and loss of pd patient so that though the loss could be due to technic failure death on peritoneal dialysis transplantation or transfer out of region they have been in a place where they have been peritoneal dialysis now they move to another country where there is no peritoneal dialysis and they have to switch back to hemodialysis so the, it is a multidisciplinary team this is the patient the most important part of the peritoneal dialysis program pd nursing team ward nursing team during training administration of fluid delivery renal pharmacist social worker a, a person to counsel the patient dietitian a transplant team to take the patient for transplantation nephrologist and an access team whether it is hemodialysis access or peritoneal dialysis access now this is a lady whom we send back home is home dialysis possible 76 year old married lady with children known ckd non diabetic she is a bejan two previous abdominal surgeries we have put her on apd 10 liters and she has a dry day we are not initially fluid during the day ultra filtration 1 to 1.2 liters she has also got good residual renal function she is doing 2.5% exchange two exchanges with 5 liter bag she is holding a 2 liter bag and this is a, a home a cfpd a scan and she is able to lift it up with it now you the three elements of successful pd are a healthy peritoneum as shown here then you need to have a access which is a, a pd catheter and the third thing is that fluid uh, in collapsible bag so here i will explain you this cartoon this is the basement membrane this is the peritoneal cavity you have the single layer of mesothelial cell sitting there and this is the interstitium and there are muscle cells and also lymph vessels uh, extracellular matrix and fibroblast and the peritoneal cavity here so the peritoneum comes in contact with the dialysis fluid which is glucose containing dialysis fluid here and the more the fluid the better the contact of the peritoneum with the fluid and hence you have more ultra filtration and more removal of the solute the further the fluid is from the as it is shown here and the less will be a peritoneal dialysis effective so you have the showing here the aquaporin you have the peritoneal cavity here higher glucose concentration the osmotic profile the water flows because of osmotic flow through the aquaporins into the uh, peritoneal cavity 
and uh, then lower glucose concentration here here there is high glucose concentration which is creating the osmotic gradient and here is a scarred peritoneum see the sub mesothelial these are the mesothelial cells sub mesothelial area the basement membrane is thick it has become quite thick here if it is thin here and you have issues with uh, leading to ultra filtration problems and failure due to chronic fibrosis cell extracellular matrix and here you see the muscle cells and you also see uh, neovascularity the number of blood vessels here are less compared to here and this will lead to the loss of uh, and osmotic pressure and this is the uh, this is a, an expansion or elongation or enlargement of this you have three types of pores you have the intracellular pores the intercellular pores and the large intercellular pores so 50% of the osmotic ultrafiltration is through the intracellular pores and the other 50% of osmotic ultrafiltration is through the small intercellular pores and mainly the large intercellular pores which are few in number are mainly for uh, removal of protein so i want you to understand this basic cartoon and how it works as shown three four model and how this can be an effectively produce peritoneal dial now this is the same lady whom i spoke about whom you saw in the picture earlier on when since because she had previous abdominal surgery catheter was implanted laparoscopically you can see that there is there are additions there so additional lysis were done and then when we were flushing her catheter and it was hemoperitoneal so we were not sure whether this peritoneum would work but luckily the peritoneum is working now and she is on apd with an ultra filtration of 1 to 1.2 so do not give up so if you have a patient with the previous abdominal surgery always do a laparoscopic implantation and tell the laparoscopic surgeon to look for additions and if there are minor additions you can do additionalizes without loss of mesothelial cell and basement membrane so it is the responsibility of the pd team either it is the chief nurse or the nephrologist or the surgeon who should be seeing the abdomen this is a lady we made a stand up and we wanted the exit site to be here because if you put the exit site here as you put the fluid in the fat will cover the fat laden abdomen will cover the exit site so we made a stand up we bar the exit site this is going to be the exit site and this is the extra peritoneal portion of the catheter this is the subcutaneous tissue and the catheter venester so after you implant the catheter make sure that this is the exit site and this is on a manicure the catheter should be rounded up like this rather than straight Uh, down because there could be pull on the catheter and torque on the catheter giving the like to exercise so always the catheter should be rounded up in such a way so to avoid any pull or pressure or torque and this is the transverse set you can you can see the transverse set and uh, this is being kept in a pouch so how to prevent exercise infection so you have uh, this swan neck catheter so i have already spoken to this is the exit site this is the distal cup this, this is the proximal cup this is the intraperitoneal portion of the catheter in the pelvis so avoid previous scars skin fold skin infection and skin fold right or left hand redness patient preference the tunnel is marked using a stencil the exit hole would be created at least 2 cm away from the belt line so always avoid the belt line shave the abdomen and remove hair bowel preparation with an enema on the day of the surgery antibiotic prophylaxis we usually use 1 uh, g iv vancomycin and absence of catheter king in the tunnel make sure that there is no king catheter tube location in true pelvis predict excellent catheter function and then immobilization of the catheter for 2 weeks avoid vertical position of dialysis for 2 weeks if you want to do urgent peritoneal dialysis so this is the immobilization of the catheter see that the catheter is immobilized the external parts of the catheter here for doing any flushing and this is the lady and she is speaking to another peritoneal dialysis patient to infuse confidence through zoom and they can see each other 
so that this lady is confident that uh, there is somebody who is experienced in peritoneal dialysis, a patient, she's an ambassador, and who speaks to her. She, this patient whom she speaks to her is on you know, home peritoneal dialysis for 18 years. So this uh, interconnectivity infuses encouragement and also enthusiasm and confidence in the patient. So are three exchanges suitable for Asian patients on peritoneal dialysis? Given the financial constraints in countries in Asia, small liver polyum dialysis of six liters daily may be an acceptable compromise in some patient populations with a smaller body size, as they have done in Hong Kong for many years, and significant residual renal function. Our dialysis code should be individualized according to the needs of the patient. So national dialysis K KPI project, we should look at the dialysis adequacy, PD access, biochemical target, anemia treatment and iron, patient survival, technique survival, and dialysis delivery infection rate. What is the infection rate with regard to exit site or peritonitis rate? So this is the concept of adequacy. It is like a jigsaw puzzle. And unless you have every element in the right context, you will not have adequacy of dialysis. So adequacy, you should do. Social, physical, and mental well-being. Then small solute clearance should be over 1.7 kT over B. Fluid total in a new patient should be over 70 kcc per day. Nutrition BMI should be adequate and acid-base balance bicarbonate should be above 22 millimoles. Bone disease, mineral bone disease, IPTH should not exceed two to nine fold. And anemia, hemoglobin should be 11 and residual renal function maintenance. So there are different elements in adequacy concept, not one element. And this should this is like a jigsaw puzzle, and it should be met. Now, what is peritoneal equilibration test? Peritoneal equilibration test is done to know the peritoneal membrane characteristics with regard to transfer of glucose, creatinine, and other things. So Tardowski has divide, divided the patients into four categories high transportation, high average, low average, and low. These are the two uh, group of patients who do well on uh, CFD, the high average and low average, and uh, D by D0 glucose, and this is high, this is high average, low average at the end of, and low at the end of four hours. And then creatine D by P, dialysis by plasma creatine, this is high, is 0.8103 at the end of four hours, which is 0 0.82 to 1. And then high average is 0 0.65 to 0.8. And then low average is 0 0.5 to 0 0.64. And low is 0 0.34 to 0 0.49. So please see the color coding here. Those who are low, they have very high drain volume. They don't lose the concentration gradient. Those who are low average, the ultra filtration volume is somewhere shown here. So here it is over 3,000 with four exchanges. Here it is two, between 1,000 uh, 2, 2, and 2,500. And then as the drain volume falls, so if you are a high transporter, your drain volume falls. Now, what is ultra filtration failure? Ultra filtration failure is defined as a volume of less than, if you put a two liter, 4.25% dextrose. At the end of four hours, if the uh, return is less than 2,400, that is ultrafiltration is less than 400, you call it as ultrafiltration failure. The ultrafiltration problems are encountered in PD patients, as I said, more in diabetic. It is about 6% uh, at one year, and it could be as high as 30% at six years of peritoneal dialysis. Now, primary membrane failure, we had two patients with primary membrane failure. They never had any abdominal surgery, and we tried to put them on peritoneal dialysis. Catheter was implanted, but they were absorbing the fluid. And so this is a professor of surgery, 87 years old, who wanted to do home peritoneal dialysis. He was a diabetic with the IgM paraproteinemia. And when we did the biopsy of the peritoneum, it shows thin walled vascular channels. You can see so many vascular channels. And also, what is shown in blue is extensive fibrosis. So this is idiopathic peritoneal fibrosis. Either is it due to diabetes or as a result of IgM paraproteinemia. 
leading to primary membrane failure. So we had to switch him over to hemodialysis and his IgM baraproteinemia is not being treated. He's 87, he's doing very well. And we didn't rush because if he went to an oncologist, they would have definitely given him um, um, uh, chemotherapy. So this is a very interesting patient. Patient cares six years on CAPD and he developed a fungal peritonitis. This was due to a bag which was contaminated and this was supplied to him and this led to fungal peritonitis. So peritoneal bag is six weeks after the removal. So if you have a fungal peritonitis, you wait for six weeks before you implant the catheter. If it is a bacterial peritonitis, you can do as early as four weeks. So what we saw was secondary failure. So we were worried he wanted to do peritoneal dialysis and he had failure of the fluid. So what we did was I kept him on hemodialysis. This was an experiment. And uh, this shows the sign hematoxylin and eosin staining of the peritoneal biopsy, demonstrating fibrosis, black arrow, and the mesothelial hyperplasia, red arrow, and myosin trichrome staining of peritoneal biopsy showing extensive fibrosis. So this is this was the laparoscopic view of peritoneal addition. So what I did was we gave him peritoneal rest for three weeks. He was on hemodialysis. Then we started him on icodexin, 7.5, two liters, two into one liter dienial. And uh, then he has, he regained the function of his peritoneum and he is continuing on peritoneal dialysis. So we thought it is a secondary failure, but we gave rest to the peritoneum and uh, six weeks rest. Uh, I think it was, let me go back on the uh, six, three weeks uh, rest after the implantation of the catheter. He, the peritoneum started working and he's doing very well with tycotexin and dineal solution. Now, changes in peritoneal membrane transport rate in patients on long term peritoneal dialysis. This we published in advance in 1989. And this is D by D0 of our glucose. And this is the vertical axis and this is the horizontal axis showing the time on CAPD for months up to 30 months. What you do is D by D0, that is dialysate. Uh, uh, ratio to the to the fluid uh, glucose ratio over a period of time you can see that there is a decrement in that and the ultra filtration volume is also decreasing and uh, then we looked at the, this is a net ultra filtration there is loss slight loss of ultra filtration change in mean d by d0 ratio for glucose and in mean ultra filtration that means this patient is moving from a lower transport status to a higher transport status. So these are the clearance rates shown by creatinine, uh, D by P creatinine, and the creatinine is increasing, suggesting D by P creatinine, suggesting a higher peritoneal transport rate for creatinine. So uh, always the Western literature says that peritoneal dialysis patient has more metabolic acidosis compared to hemodialysis patient. This is a study we did. You can see the hemodialysis patient, mean bicarbonate level, and uh, this is a peritoneal dialysis patient. So the myth that the Western has said that the hemodialysis patients have better uh, and bicarbonate level is not right. And uh, this is what we found. And the bicarbonate fluctuations during hemodialysis is shown here. This is 20 millimoles to 30 millimoles. So this is, these are the hemodialysis sessions and what happens to the bicarbonate level. Now, this is predictors of long-term survival on peritoneal dialysis in South India, a multi-center study involving four centers. And uh, these are the clinical parameters shown, hemoglobin, ultrafiltration. Uh, this is uh, initial and at the end of three years, a uh, PET, uh, systolic BP, diastolic BP, EPO use, EPO frequency, BMI, serum aldo, calcium, phosphorus product, blood urea, and uh, this is uh, creatine. So what I want to show you is the next one. So the predictors of long-term surveillance and peritoneal dialysis, and as you see that the, as time goes on, zero to 55 months duration, at the end of three years, uh, you have 76% of the patients are surviving in a multi-center study. Probability of taking survival in patients on peritoneal dialysis 209. 
and who are those patients who survive? This multi-center cohort study of prevalent continuous 3D patients in South India showed non-diabetic, average transportation, non-smokers with reasonable nutrition status, with a hemoglobin of 11 grams, with a low peritonitis rate, with the ultra filtration of one liter or more, the great majority that joined, then we had something called one cell lifetime payment scheme, whereby you deposit a capital amount and you are given the peritoneal dialysis for the rest of your life, and the reimbursement group survived longer. Peritonitis rate in the longer survival group was one episode every 75 patient months compared to one episode every 30 patient months in those who survived less than three years. Now, let us move on to the complications, the infective complications. The most common infective complication is exit site infection. This is a perfect exit site. See the catheter and the exit site. And this is grade one infection, according to Tadovsky. You can see that there is redness there, and also there are some crust formations. And this is grade two. Uh, purulent or bloody drainage is only present in the sinus, not anywhere else. This is a sinus and cannot be exposed outside. Often suggests low grade infection that may improve spontaneously or progressively left untreated. Uh, so the most serious and common exit site pathogens are Staphylococcus aureus, Pseudomonas aerogenosa. As these organisms frequently lead to peritonitis, such infections must be treated aggressively. Any exit site infection should be treated. A swab should be taken, not from here. There should be material, purulent material, and a swab should be taken. Otherwise, if you take a swab, you will see common sense. So swab should be taken. And treatment should be for about eight to 10 days with oral antibiotics, of depending upon the, the, the culture. And uh, the exit site cleaning and care is a very important part to be taught to the patient every day, the shower technique and the exit site um, uh, care. So oral antibiotic therapy is generally recommended with the exception of methicillin resistant staph aureus. So acute exit site infection, an acute infection is characterized by redness, swelling, and tenderness. The, the measurement from the sinus edge to the border of the edge is greater than three to four millimeters, as it is shown in this. And then chronic exit site infection, granulation tissue typically present both externally and in the sinus of the exit site. There is usually no pain, redness, or swelling, and the skin is often hyperpigmented. Then this is tunnel infection. Tunnel infections are associated with the redness, swelling, and tenderness over the tunnel. This is the tunnel proximal to the exit site. And may be accompanied by intermittent or chronic purulent or bloody drainage that discharges spontaneously or after pressure on the cup. So cup extrusion with pseudomonas aerogenosa in one of our patients. And this is uh, this was the uh, 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 catheter, external part of the catheter. And the distal cup was infected with Pseudomonas serogenosa, and the cup is resistant to antibiotics. So what we did is we did a de-roofing of the cup. The cup came out and it was shaped. And we have a this is the previous exercise, and we have a new exercise with the partially shaped cup and relocated exercise for cup extrusion and exercising. So antibiotics were given. Cup shaving was done partially, and a new exit site was created, and the patient did very well. So here is an exit site infection with tunnel infection. It was a methicillin sensitive staph aureus. You can see that there is redness and tenderness, and this is the exit site and the ultrasound of the tunnel after three weeks of antibiotics. Still, this is this is the catheter. You can see that, and there is still some collection there. So appropriate antibiotic therapy was given for three weeks. If no resolution, replace catheter under antibiotic cover through other sites away from the current exit site and tunnel. Now, peritoneal host defenses. What are the peritoneal hosts? There is less than 50 ml of fluid, 7 to 12 million cells. Peritoneal macrophages are 90%. Lymphocytes are 5 to 10%. And neutrophils are less than 5% in the normal peritoneal cavity. There is a single layer of continuous mesothelial cells with a density of 10 to the power of nine cells for one to two meters square, low number of fibroblasts in the interstitium, resident and infiltrating cells precipitate, participate in eliminating invading pathogens, restore normal tissue, 
and immunoglobulins and complement are present. So when you do peritoneal dialysis for years together, you wash out all these things, immunoglobulins and complement, and also the macrophages. So a late onset peritonitis uh, does not resolve easily, and it can lead to morbidity and mortality. So this shows this cartoon shows the leukocyte infiltration in acute peritonitis, dysregulated peritonitis, and in chronic. So initially you have acute peritonitis, you have neutrophils. Once you treat, they recede in numbers in the peritoneal dialysis fluid. The T and B cells then come in, and the monocytes, this is the resolution, and they resolve. And in this regulated, the monocytes uh, increase, the polymorphonuclear leukocytes become less, and the lymphocytes are there. So maintenance of leukocyte infiltrate, exacerbation of disease process, and unsuccessful resolution, the cell phenotype response in peritonitis is shown here. Now, roots of peritoneal infection, when you have a spike, like system, this is the spike where you can contaminate. Then you have the pericatheter, that is the titanium transverset where you can have mistakes and leaks. And this is the exit site infection. Then you have the peritonitis developing spontaneously without exit site infection or tunnel infection. And it could be transcolonic yeah, migration or it could be hematogenous from infective endocarditis then gynecologic categories, and if you do dental procedure without antibiotic cover, a low level of septicemia, and they can develop peritonitis. So what are the clinical features of peritonitis are abdominal pain, cloudy fluid with the WBCs over 100, with over 50% neutrophil, two out of three is necessary for diagnosis. Microbiology, so these are the three. Then relapsing peritonitis is Another episode of peritonitis caused by the same genus species within four weeks of completing antibiotic course. Refractive peritonitis is no improvement five days after appropriate antibiotic therapy, which will require ca ca catheter removal. This is a large Indian study which we did on um, multicenter study, and there are so many others involved in that on peritoneal dialysis related peritonitis. So, differential diagnosis this is a two liter dialysis fluid. You collapse to the back, and it is very clear as you can see that. And then you have uh, the drain fluid, which is slightly yellowish thing, and this is cloudy back. Cloudy back are due to culture positive infective peritonitis. Then it may be due to due to in, in infective peritonitis with sterile cultures, chemical peritonitis, eosinophilia of the effluent. This is usually seen in the early part of peritoneal dialysis, for which the treatment is not antibiotic. It will just subside by itself. Hemoperitonia I have shown. Malignancy rare. Chylus effluent. I have seen once in a patient with lymphoma. Then specimen taken from a dry abdomen. That is, patient is not on peritoneal dialysis. You had some mild ascites and it may look cloudy. So peritonitis will lead to peritoneal membrane damage, hospitalization, and pain. catheter loss, malnutrition, Transfer to hemodialysis, encapsulating peritoneal sclerosis, technic failure, and death. So, TB peritonitis, uh, the BC, the TB peritonitis, and uh, Hong Kong, they see TB peritonitis. I'm sure Africa, you will have TB peritonitis. TB peritonitis is underdiagnosed. It is a culture negative peritonitis, not responding to conventional antibiotics, require repeated specimens for AFP, smear, and culture. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, nuclear amplification, PCR testing may help. Catheter removal, not necessary if treatment is initiated within four weeks. If we, earlier people were recommending that any TB peritonitis catheter should be removed. No, if you treat, they regain their function and the peritonitis settles down, but the treatment should be extended for a minimum period of one year, not six months. Uh, peritoneal dialysis, uh, related peritonitis due to mycobacterium. If you want the uh, insight into that, this is a paper which we have published elsewhere, and uh, this talks about the uh, diagnosis and also about the literature review. Now, any so any peritonitis unresponsive to conventional therapy should be investigated for tuberculous peritonitis. Tuberculous peritonitis can exist as a co-infection. You may have Staphylococcus, and you treat that, but the peritonitis is not resolving. Look for TB, co-infection. 
In the situation of chemotherapy without delay will preserve peritoneal membrane integrity. So this is one of the fungal peritonitis, actinomyces peritonitis. You have to remove the catheter. There is no way you can treat fungal peritonitis without removal of the catheter. So if there is a patient, it was a nurse who had pre treated in 2017. This is done a transplantation done. Graft nephrectomy soon after that because the thrombus of the graft continued on PD, peritonitis relapsing, fluid clear, but then exercise. But uh, she she lost her catheter and she had to go on hemodialysis. Now this is these are two very interesting features. Uh, very uh, rarely ever we do CT scan of the peritoneal dialysis patient abdomen. So here is a patient where one patient is on 30 years on CAPD. No ultrafiltration failure, aneuric. This is a peritoneal CT scan showing peritoneal membrane, linear peritoneal membrane cal calcification. And uh, this is another patient, and this is coming out uh, as an image of nephrology in Sydney International in the August issue. Patient on 18 years, but uh, she had TB peritonitis about 16 years ago, which was completely treated, no ultrafiltration failure. This is not a contrast picture she is showing multiple uh, peritoneal calcification here, here, all over the place. And see this patient. This patient also has coronary calcification as shown here, right coronary and the left coronary. So she fits in the category of, uh, although not diabetic, uh, mineral uh, bone disease, CKD mineral bone disease, CKD MD. Now, what is the nutrition for patient on peritoneal dialysis? Protein 1.2 to 1.3 gram, which 50% of that should be of high biological value. During peritonitis, this has to be increased to 1.5 gram. Calories 30 to 35 kilocalories. Each day, they will uh, have about 60 grams of glucose absorbed from the peritoneal cavity, producing nearly 300 to 300 and 400 kilocalories from the dialysis itself. Sodium varies with the cost. Usual is 2 to 4 grams, potassium, phosphorus, fiber, vitamins, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, vitamin B6, folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin C not to exceed 600 milligram, biotin, and pantothenic acid. Now, protein, this is a, uh, our dietitian's uh, uh, analysis of our PD patients. Initial assessment, energy was 1,200 calories. First follow up after three months, protein in grams in non vegetarian and in vegetarian is shown here. And on follow up, there is a remarkable increase in the protein intake. I salute our nutritionist, a dietitian. Then, high biological value protein, uh, vegetarians, they were consuming 30%, and then it has increased. So, energy and protein intake increase. Commercial supplement helped to achieve. 50% high biological value protein. This is an Indian study. And also, this is this shows kaplan mayer survival curve of patients with different uh, PNI, protein, nitrogen intake values. So if you have, look, these patients, they have better survival compared to those who have lower nitrogen protein intake. Now, appetite stimulants can be used. Appetite stimulants such as megastrol acetate, cannabinoids and anabolic steroids such as Oxandrolone have been used anecdotally to increase protein intake in severely. The other thing is that patients have a satiety feeling. So the food can be taken during empty peritoneal cavity at the end of dialysis exchange. That is, you haven't filled up the peritoneal cavity, you have emptied the peritoneal cavity, and then you can eat. So diabetic versus non-diabetic PD survival, diabetic had insidious survival versus non-diabetic which we published in 1987, I think it stands true even today. Now, what are the non-infective complications? Non-infective complications are due to increased intraabdominal pressure. They can be hernia sanding. So this is genital swelling as a surgical complication of continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. And we looked at that. Genital edema was seen as a complication of CAPD in 18 patients in our large cohort in Toronto, who accounted for 4% of all patients on CAPD. In the majority of patients, the swelling develops suddenly and painlessly in the scrotum, penis or labia majora. Some of these patients noted ultrafiltration failure because fluid which has ultrafiltrated was going into the, into the genitalia. 
and a trial of temporary discontinuation of CFD or intermittent peritoneal dialysis using small volume of small volume of dialysis fluid prevented recurrence while reinstituting CFD in patients with normal finding from contrast studies intermittent peritoneal dialysis. So here is what you see. What you do is when you see the scrotal link and the penile link, you want to find out whether it is due to a leak, due to a tear in the tunica vaginal. So what you do is you have a two liter dialysis solution at 60 ml of um, in the contrast and make the patient walk around for about two hours, then take the narrow cross cut at the genital region to look for. So you can see that there is leak of the fluid and here also you can see bilateral leak and what it needs is uh, put the patient on temporary hemodialysis and then surgical repair and wait for about four to five weeks before you reinstitute peritoneal dialysis. So this is a, a, which I haven't seen before. This lady was on peritoneal dialysis for 10 years and there was a rupture of the catheter. See the catheter close to the pit. So what we did was she came immediately to the hospital. She was given prophylactic antibiotics to develop, to prevent the development of a peritonitis. And what we did was Many people thought that uh, we should replace the catheter, but we had a short, uh, short uh, stem sitting there, stem sitting there. So we connected the titanium adapter and the transfer set to that. So we had two catheter ruptures. This is one of the patients who has won peritoneal dialysis for 10 years. Now, the other complication is uh, hydrothorax, massive hydrothorax. Usually hydrothorax is seen on the right side due to a defect in the diaphragm. Defect in diaphragm, hemidiaphragm, as you have seen here. We recently had a patient, it was reported, developing a diabetic middle aged man, left side of massive hydrothorax. So, these are the, this is our publication, what we did with that. So, the emergency treatment is stop peritoneal dialysis, thoracosynthesis, switch to hemodialysis. The clinical features are dyspnea, weight gain, diminished ultra filtration, chest pain abdominal pain, hypertension, increased drainage through the chest tube, if you put a chest tube. And so uh, the, uh, the surgical closure of the diaphragmatic defect is possible, or fluorodesis using tetracycline, tac talc is magnesium trisilicate, triamcinol on acetate, or fibrin glue, and uh, intermittent peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis, and then restart them on peritoneal dialysis. So this is another patient recently we had about one month ago with the genital leak, you can see the leak here and with the contrast in, and this patient had multiple myeloma and he was, he also had hepatitis B. So he's being treated for multiple myeloma. At the same time, he developed a genital leak. So we had to repair that. And this is the patient uh, with the left side at the uh, hemo, uh, left side at hydrothorax, we did a thoracoscopy and we were unable to find any large defect in the diaphragm on the left side. And this is the diaphragmatic peritoneum or the diaphragm which is seen through the thoracoscope. So this, we formed the peritoneum. Lloyd is in this, Dr. Nayak, and this is the Peritoneal Dialysis Society of India was formed in uh, 1997. And I think that Africa should have, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa should have a peritoneal dialysis society to take the activities forward. So our contribution to peritoneal dialysis are, uh, this is Professor Oriopoulos, Joan Bergman and Sharon. This is myself and my dearest nurse, Padma, who trains so many people from different parts of the world. This is my colleague, Millie Mackey. So our contribution from Chennai are uh, educating people on peritoneal dialysis from Pakistan, from Nepal, from Sri Lanka, and uh, some of the countries in Africa and Middle East are shown here. So this is uh, the peritoneal dialysis utilization across the globe, published in clinical kidney journal, over 30%, 20 to 29%, 10 to 19%, and less than 10%. So some of the African countries like South Africa has good penetration and other countries have uh, absolutely no PD utilization as shown here. So this is a study which we did looking at uh, uh, 250 nephrologists in South Asia, the fact is how to make PD affordable in developing countries. 2009, lack of extended care facility support is one of the reasons. Percentages are shown here, 20 to 100. 
and physician issues related to decreased reimbursement was expressed by 80% of the patients and lack of CKD education uh, shown by nearly 90% of patients. So out of our two challenges is not, is not we do not know, but we do not do what we know. So this is the Indian Journal of Peritoneal Dialysis. I was editor-in-chief for 16 years and since 2004 to 2019, May, some of your African colleagues have contributed to that. Now this journal is taken over by Dr. Sandosh Vari. So these were my issues which I published over a period of uh, 15 years. And uh, I am sure that all of you know that the, at the World Congress in Cape Town, we donated, this is a catheter which is manufactured by myself and my colleague, which is called the Georgian Sadish Peritoneal Dialysis Catheter. It is a swan neck catheter and available in swan neck and straight and whatever configuration, custom manufacturing to require length and sub numbers made in India using latest indigenous techniques are made from thylastic, which is radiopaque and platinum curved, affordable, safe and efficient. So this is made by, and we donated 100 catheters to the African program during the World Congress of Nephrology in Cape Town. And this is uh, John P. Harry, Fred Singlestein, myself, Satish, and uh, McKinnon, Mac and uh, I forgot uh, this gentleman's name. Anyhow, it doesn't matter. Probably. So this is what, uh, so Madras Medical Devices and Tanker Foundation India are donating 100 peritoneal dials. Tanker Foundation is a charity organization which uh, I founded and the African program has shown here at Cape Town. Now, this is our PD team. This is the mannequin in our dialysis unit to explain to the patient. This is my colleague, Dr. Milimathu, and these are the nurses who, who practice and who train the patients on peritoneal dialysis. And this is my dearest surgeon, Dr. Nagarajan, who puts PD catheter through laparoscopy or through uh, the bedside technique, and also who removes the catheter and a fistula surgeon, as well as he is a, uh, he is a transplant surgeon. So the last slide, multidisciplinary team meeting, team meetings can ensure all potential PD candidates are identified, assessed and offered PD, maximize the number of patients who start dialysis electively with pre-dialysis care, target acute hemo, hemodialysis starts early to ensure they are offered PD, um, uh, availability of family home care, paid caregiver, nursing home care, can enhance PD penetration. Patient choice is a modifiable determinant of PD utilization. Our Honorable Prime Minister's uh, initiative for including PD in the Prime Minister at JY is the future of PD for India. There is a large variability of PD utilization globally and locally. And uh, thank you for your kind attention. And I am willing to take any, any questions from the floor. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Georgi. That was an excellent presentation, excellent talk. Uh, it's, a, it's a question time. Can you please, uh, anyone with a question, uh, you can ask Professor Georgi. That was excellent presentation. Yeah. Yes, um, the yeah, like, fungal peritonitis. Yeah, you say for, yeah, and uh, I was wondering for how long will you be removing the catheter before you reinsert it again? Okay, so if you have fungal peritonitis, we remove the catheter immediately. Okay. If you have a refractive peritonitis, that is, I have already explained that. And a peritonitis with a tunnel infection is an indication to remove the catheter. Because even if you sterilize the peritoneal cavity, the tunnel will be infected. So a tunnel infection with an associated peritonitis requires the removal of the catheter. A fungal peritonitis requires the removal of the catheter. And then a, a a serious bubble perforation peritonitis will recur removal of the catheter, and uh, then a refractory peritonitis will recur removal of the catheter. So after removing the catheter, you wait for about uh, four weeks in bacterial peritonitis and six weeks in fungal peritonitis. Good evening, Dr. Uh -huh. Abraham. Thank you for your uh, nice presentation. My name is Lakshmi, and I teach nephrology nursing in uh, Rwanda. So uh, yeah. the, in, in your recommendation, you told that uh, one nurse for 30 patients uh, yes. is recommended. Is it international recommendation or it's from the, and is it practical to do that? Well, see the way what we are doing is in Toronto that uh, patients, one nurse is assigned to 30 patients and these are all home dialysis patients 
and these patients are given that nurse's number and this particular nurse is responsible for day to day care but if they have a problem they come to the hospital the any nurse or doctor can take care of them and look at them so basically it is uh, and in china they had one nurse looking after many patients there especially in gangseo university so the recommend the international recommendation is uh, one nurse for uh, 30 patients Oh, thank you for that. And I do have another question. Uh, you know, in our setting, actually, due to technical expertise and also non-availability of the fluids and the pediatric uh, peritoneal dialysis sets, sometimes you know the patients are um, the opted for hemodialysis, which is very expensive. So this poses a big ethical dilemma, you know, in our setting. So, what's your recommendation regarding that? Uh, we faced the same thing in 1991. i had no catheter i had no fluid i had only three uh, uh, two or three physicians who knew how to do peritoneal dialysis from there we brought it up so it all depends on your interaction with the government with the pharmaceutical industry or manufacturing industry and we can give you catheter you know because our uh, as i said we donated 100 catheters so i have uh, already offered catheters which are the catheter in india an important catheter costs about uh, 11000 rupees i am, i am sure that you understand the indian rupee whereas mm -hmm. um, our catheter is uh, less than uh, 5000 rupees so uh, the cost of the catheter can be uh, brought down by getting the catheter from india directly you can get it you know you don't have to go through a vendor if you want you know we can mail it to you provided you don't have to pay custom duty and that way you can reduce the cost of the catheter the fluid is a big issue the fluid manufacturers you know what they do is uh, the european uh, prices they levy upon africa and thereby you have to pay for uh, more so but what you have to do is this international fluid manufacturers you have to convince them that african countries are not that rich please provide us fluid at the rate which is available in india india is the cheapest for that matter compared to any developing country yeah, and thank you yeah uh, catheter implantation we also have a set we have a pillowy sheet set along with the catheter i didn't show that uh, in uh, because of the number of slides were too much so you can uh, learn yourself how to do with a pillowy sheet in a catheter implantation in a virgin of dome Oh, thank you so much. When I visit India next time, perhaps I will visit your hospital and get to know that. Thank you very much. Call and come out. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, sir. Hi. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Kumbhman Kuryan. I am from South India, Kerala. Okay. I, I am working with the Fresh <laughs> Medical Care. I think uh, you know my manager, Kavitha uh, Manager, and sir. <laughs> and uh, congratulations for your latest book for uh, the patients. God. Yeah, your latest book. Uh, I uh, seen that. Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, and I have a one doubt because of how we can able to compare with the PD with the hemodialysis, even though it's equal to online hemodialysis or low flux conventional hemodialysis or conventional uh, high flux hemodialysis. How we can we can able to compare? See, when you look at the uh, hemo and PD, it is. Uh... oranges and apple so orange and apple we both of us like so pd is a home treatment for patients who has got uh, access failure and patients who want home therapy and those with compromised heart there are hemodialysis you know patients they are they do it either in the hospital um, uh, that's how it is practiced in india in majority of the places and uh, they there are number of them who have vascular access problems even fem cath cannot be implanted and because of thrombosis or other previous damage to the veins in the neck so these are the you have to have a teaching program whereby you have a group of nurses i have shown the group of nurses and the management so whenever a patient comes to me i speak to them about all modalities of renal replacement therapy and i say transplant is the best but then if you want home therapy it is peritoneal dialysis if you want even a hospital therapy it is hemodialysis but uh, we send this patient to our uh, uh, educated nurses and they explain both the uh, forms of therapy and then uh, probably they may have another sitting with their relatives so to for their home son home support 
So this is how we move with petroleum. So that's the reason why I have shown that in my map, which was published in a Clinical Kidney Journal about the penetration of PD. America, they had um, almost there was a steep fall in PD. Now they are again picking up PD as a treatment modality and also Thailand, China, and in other developing countries. And Sri Lanka, I, and we have patients on PD and they have a very good PD program. Uh, Bangladesh has a good PD program. Nepal has a good PD program. So I think that all these developing countries, it all depends on your, uh, uh, your interconnectivity and uh, uh, looking at uh, everything in detail and to the final. Okay, thank you. Thank all you. right. Chat box. The two yeah, yeah, there are two chat questions box. from the chat box. Do you, yes. do, do you have locally yeah. produced PD fluid? Yes, we, we do for, for locally produce PD fluid. And um, uh, whatever it may be, I told you that India has the cheapest PD program in the world. The fluid is cheapest in India compared to any other developing country. So in, in the absence of laparoscopy, what is your advice for patient to start hemodialysis, PD, who had previous again, abdominal surgery? In the, uh, um, in, the, in the absence of abdominal surgery, if you do not have a laparoscope, how will you do PD? So what we do our surgery, yes. what he does is makes a small opening in the peritoneal, little bigger than the usual one. And uh, he would use an artery for us to see that whether there is any addition. And also at the same time, we infuse fluid in the peritoneal cavity and see that uh, we infuse it and whether it is coming back, uh, returning back. So this is the way we check it in the way when you do not have a laparoscope. Would it be advisable to do a peritoneal biopsy prior to considering PD in other patients? No, not necessarily. We have a publication in the Indian Journal of Peritoneal Dialysis by Sudarshana Ghosh, who was trained with us from Tanzania. And she presented it for our Indian Society of Nephrology. I showed you that peritoneal biopsies in two patients. I have a number of peritoneal biopsies done uh, in the interest of time. I didn't. So secondary peritoneal failure, and I showed you the primary peritoneal failure. And so a peritoneal biopsy does not reflect the function of a peritoneum because peritoneum is a large organ. And just uh, seeing a, a, taking a small sample may not be, but once it helps me in a tuberculous peritonitis, in a diabetic lady, and she had uh, low grade fever. When I told the surgeon to do a peritoneal biopsy, and it showed caseating granuloma on the peritoneal biopsy, and we started there on anti tuberculous treatment while putting the catheter. And uh, however, she had a heart attack and died after two weeks, so we couldn't uh, sort of assess the treatment pattern and uh, see that what happens to the peritoneum. Uh, while we started on the anti But I can tell you one thing, I had a number of patients whom we have treated with anti-tuberculous treatment, and none of them had peritoneal membrane failure, as I have already shown you in the paper. If you start within four weeks of the, within four weeks of peritonitis, the uh, anti-tuberculous track, you won't lose the peritoneum, and the peritoneum tuberculosis settles down, and uh, the patient uh, does reasonably well on peritoneal dialysis. I showed you that uh, the CT scan of the peritoneum. The lady was on 18 years on peritoneal diet. Um, and I have this picture discussed with uh, Beth Pirino and also with Ramesh Kanna. So they were seeing it for the first time, but I am experiencing it for the first time. The patient is doing very well despite having linear calcification. So there is a, uh, and, uh, I would say that what you see on the biopsy is not functionally what you are experiencing then you do peritoneal dialysis. Thank you very much, Professor Georgi. Thank you. We really appreciate your talk. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Georgi, I think that's uh, one question that Dr. Lakshmi asked. Um, just, uh, I mean, going back to my transplant days, uh, we had actually uh, one uh, nurse transplant coordinator who looked after 300 patients. So 30 is a very, very nice number for patient care, actually. It's very good care. And it's a, it's a very nice, uh, you know, ratio. Uh, and of course, these people have a lot of problems. And uh, Toronto is a beautiful place that way where, you know, uh, I'm sure you're doing the same thing in Chennai, uh, where the patients can directly call the nurse at any point in time. And the nurse will actually direct the patient to the nurse on duty. So and I think that is the system that is there and it's beautiful, actually. So I think having a transplant coordinator nurse 
looking after 30 patients is a wonderful number. Now, just to just to add on to what Dr. Georgi said, in for the transplant, we have 300 patients to one nurse. Uh, in case of PD peritonitis, would you advise uh, intraperitoneal antibiotics or IV antibiotics? Which one would you advise? It's always, it's always intraperitoneal antibiotics, except when you have a, I told you one of the septicemia with the bacterial endocarditis. And in that case, uh, you may have to use both intraperitoneal and intravenous. I have never come across that situation at all with septicemia. So for 99.9% of the time, you use intraperitoneal antibiotics and the guidelines are given. But also you must understand that the peritonitis organism varies from place to place and the sensitivity of the culture sensitivity varies. Well. So please do you have, even though you have the peritonitis guideline published by the ISPD, use your own uh, microbiologist to look at your sensitivity and use the antibiotic intraperitoneally gram for gram positive and gram negative organisms. And uh, also, if, and until you feel that the peritonitis has resolved. And if in some patients I have seen that we lost a few patients who were on long-term peritoneal dialysis with peritonitis because their their peritoneal defenses were gone. And we removed the catheter, we did various things, but they had collection of fluid in the peritoneal cavity, abscess collection, which uh, although we drained it, it reaccumulated. So it suggests that a peritonitis which is developing late latter part of peritoneal, maybe three years, four, five years, or ten years after peritoneal dialysis is less amenable to therapy and resolution compared to a peritonitis which is developing in the early part of peritoneal dialysis. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, thank you for your time. I think uh, we have come to an end of today's uh, education webinar. We really appreciate your time. And I would like to thank everyone who attended this session today. I would like to specifically thank Dr. Lloyd for the, all the preparation that he made and everyone who attended today. Uh, Professor Georgi, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your, your great talk. And good night. And thank you very much, Dr. Georgi. Thank you very much, Dr. Georgi. That was a wonderful session. And uh, just to all the audience, I should say PD came into India because of Dr. Georgi Abraham. And he has been a proponent of, of PD across the country, he developed a catheter on his own and it's a very cheap catheter in India and has actually promoted a lot of the PD uh, companies in India as well so that the PD fluid can be made much cheaper and available to the patients and training, he has done a ton of training in India and that is why I thought he's the best person for us in the developing world to have Dr. Georgi talk to us today. Thank you so much Dr. Georgi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Lloyd for giving me this opportunity to speak to my dearest African colleagues.